Welcome, Brenda. I will introduce you and then you will give the keynote uh, introduction before we start the webinar. So Brenda, Brenda is my co-host for this webinar. She is an advocate of the High Court of Kenya. She is also a member of the Young Lawyers, Young Lawyers Committee of the East African uh, Lawyers Society, a passionate a sports law litigator. She is also a company secretary and also very much passionate on the issues of intellectual property law. Yes, Brenda, welcome. Brenda, please unmute yourself. So I think Brenda has uh, technical issues. I can go straight to the topic of the day. Today we are doing sports, uh, sports, uh, sports law generally. And our main topic for discussion is understanding the sports law landscape, the concepts of sports law, image rights and sports disputes in the world. We have speakers drawn from all over the world, including, including Professor Juan de Dios Crespo Perez. We have Alex Luganda. We also have Janet Caticia. And then we have Denise Lukambi, all of whom uh, are advocates and uh, specialist uh, sports lawyers. Uh, this is how we are going to have our panel, our webinar for today. We are going to have the panelists present on specific chosen topics, after which we will go into the question and answer section. Then if, uh, members, attendees can shoot their questions to specific uh, panelists, or they can, uh, they can ask general questions through the question and answer section, which then we can refer to the specific panelists for, to respond. We will have this webinar for two hours, which is going to be at 16.00 East African time. Yes, and welcome all, and thank you. So I think Brenda is now up and available, and she is going to introduce the first speaker, who is Prof. Brenda, welcome. Uh, uh, welcome once again. My name is Brenda. Uh, um, the co-host for today. So our first speaker is Professor Juan de Dios Crespo from Spain. He's an attorney and is the owner and co-director of Ruiz Huerta and Crespo, a law firm with more than 60 years experience where he heads the sports law department. He's also a member of the Union of International Lawyers. Um, he's a member of the International and EU Law of the Valencia Bar a member of the International Association of Sports Law in Olympia, Greece, a member of the UIA Committee of Sports Law, Spanish delegate. He's a member of the Spanish Sports Lawyers Association, a member of the British Association of Sports Lawyers, a member of the Association of International Football Lawyers, a member of the Latin American Association of Sports Law, he, uh, he served as the president of the sports law section of the Valencia Bar from 2000 to 2012. Uh, Professor Crespo is a lawyer of the Bar of Valencia. Uh, he specialized in sports law and international contracts law. He is the in-house legal advisor of Spanish clubs such as Valencia CF, Villarreal, Real Valladolid. He's an external lawyer of professional football, uh, the prof Spanish Professional Football League, La Liga. He, is a, he served as a single judge of appeal of the Valencia Federation of Futsal. I could go on and on and on, but welcome so much, Prof. You can go on. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, and I've just been nominated uh, a member of the board of the Middle East uh, Sports Association, so you can add a bit more if you want. This is not because I'm, I'm good in my in my field because I'm old. As I was saying to Mokwa, Mokwa is younger than the, age, the time I've been practicing as a lawyer. So, 
let's see that uh, I'm trying today to give you uh, a lecture about my experience. And uh, I would like to uh, say thank you to Brenda, to Mokwa, to the East African Law Society Young section, and to, of course, the East African Law Society itself. It's a pleasure. I've been in, um, in Kenya uh, three years ago, and it was really a pleasure. More than 150 people there in the the National Theater in Nairobi. Uh, I was delighted to see that young lawyers in Africa are willing to understand the field of sport. And this is my first topic. I will, I will go on three topics. The first one will be on, on the a general matter of introduction of sports law. The second one, image rights. And the third one will be after, at the end of, of this, of the day, uh, the Court of Ambition for Sport on appeal, because there was there was going to be also another lecturer uh, lecturing about the DRC before FIFA dispute on chamber. So I will just add on that. And um, the first thing we have to say, the first thing we have to say here. Oh, sorry, did, can you can you see me or not? We can see you, Prof. You can see me. We can see you. So the first thing I have to say about sports law is that. Sports law is now something that everybody is talking about. This is fine, it's clear, sports law exists. But when I started uh, some decades ago, nobody was willing to, to bet uh, on the sports law market or the sports law field at all. Why? Because nobody thinks that at that time, sports law would be nothing else but you know contracts, transfers, and so on. Now we have from uh, Contract, of course, transfer, of course, to betting, to racism, to disciplinary, good governance, ethics, corruption, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We have a lot to do. And we are not anymore lawyers or after sports lawyers, but we are specialists within a field of sports law. For instance, my uh, specialty right now is international uh, transfers and FIFA and CAS cases. And I'm also working on basketball and on handball uh, as, a, as a professor, as a member of uh, an arbitration and so on. So you can see that <clears throat> when everything started decades ago, people were, were thinking that there was no room for sports law. And there is a room. And that's why I want you to be aware of that. And more in your countries. Africa needs a lot of sports lawyers. Of course, we are not, I can't say ahead of you, but we have more experience than you in Europe. More experience than, than, than uh, lawyers in, in Asia. Sure, because, because we were the first one to start. But sports law need, please, need sports lawyer from the country, from your countries. Why? Because a lot of clubs, a lot of federations, Olympic committees won't be, make any more mistakes if they had people like you being aware of what sports law is. And what sports law is, as introduction, I don't want to, to be a professor here and to say, look, look at this book or the other. Sports law is what is a wrong sport, starting from, for instance, the restriction of a player in football, in basketball, in any sport. You register the player in a national federation. This is the first step. And when somebody said you can't be registered because you are too young to register, or you are a foreigner and in this country, you, we can't accept foreigners and so on. This is a first step. This is a bureaucratic and administrative sports law. The first one. Then you have the same player signing a contract and this is labor sports law in a lot of countries. My country, Spain, for instance, was the first one to, to have a special uh, sports law for professional uh, athletes, then Italy, then other countries. And this is the first step to make a difference between the normal employees and the athletes, the sportsmen and women. Why? Because they are so different. The first case, for instance, you sign a contract. Are you free to leave from your contract if you sign with a 
rugby, basketball, football, any, um, or cyclism, which is considered as a team sport. Can you leave at any time you want? No, you have to maintain your contract up to the end or breach the contract by paying a clause for being free or having the possibility to end the contract because of a breach by the employer, the club, etc. And when you are a lawyer, when you are a gardener, when you are a barman, when you are a doctor, you don't need to do that. You end your contract whenever you want and you won't have any sanction, sporting sanction. You won't be a, a sanctioned by your federation saying that you can't play anymore during four, six months, that sport. So this is the crucial difference. So you have first restriction of the player, it's administrative law. Then you have the contract of the player, which is clearly uh, labor law. Then you have the following step. You're signing a contract and you have several issues there. You have the labor law, that's for sure. You have a commercial law, which is the image right. We are going to talk about image rights later on, but just a commercial law. Then you have, a, after a couple of years, you're good enough and they want you to be transferred. Transferred to the NBA or transferred to the, to the uh, Europe for a football club. And then you have another kind of, of, of law. This is not exactly labor law, but it's related because you will have to sign a new contract with an, another uh, employer in another country where so you have to learn about other laws, foreign laws. Then you have a commercial issue because you are selling, the club is selling the player to another club. So you have a commercial issue here too, but the different one than the one of, of uh, image rights. Then you might play well, but you have, you are strong and you're too strong and you make a lot of, uh, of uh, rough play. And you are booked by red card often. And this is another issue. You will have a lawyer defending you on disciplinary sports law. For booking, sure. For racism, for betting. And you might say, but betting is not forbidden. In some countries, a player, a football player, has no right to bet. And then it will be sanctioned nationally and sometimes internationally. Then the player is a youngster or she's a youngster and somebody offers him or her a drug, cocaine, etc. And then there will be another disciplinary law, but not the same as the booking, the betting, the draft. There will be uh, anti-doping sports law, which is another one, different, totally different. And then you will have to defend that. Right now I have three or four cases in which I'm involved. And there are a range of boxing, for instance, uh, equitation, yes. Uh, gymnastic, why not? A lot. So this is a special one. Then you, I, I'm, I'm doing the life of a sport man or woman. Then the lady or the guy wants to do something different. I said, look, I score a goal, which is a nice goal. And could I just try to sell that goal, not as an image right, but as a non-fungible token, NFT, which is a novelty. Non-fungible token means that there's something that you have in your computer or your TV, it's you, you're owning that, you're the only one because somebody has signed that you are the only one having that particular one. And last week, one of my clients sold uh, an NFT, non fungible token of Zanetti. Javier Zanetti, the old captain of Inter di Milano. And Zanetti was just selling a picture made by an artist of himself and the three cups, the league, Italian league, Italian cup, and the Champions League from Europe. With the voice of the player, Javier, 
in English and in Spanish, talking about how it comes to be the captain of the team winning the triplet, the three uh, cups. And that's what was sold for 17,000 US dollar. You might say it's not that much, but come on. There's another field, commercial email rights in a different model. I mean, everything is as a possibility in sport. And what I'm saying that sports is not something, uh, sports is something that is straight there forever. It's not a statue, it's not something that that statuettes, it doesn't move. Sports law is moving. As I said last week, this NFT, non fungible token. So you can see a lot more. Then you have a club, the club in which your, your client is playing. And the club made a mistake. They had a match fixing. And then you have disciplinary issues on match fixing, which is different, totally different. Then you have another club who is willing to participate in the competition and he has to pass the test of the financial fair play. And that financial fair play is not an easy task. You have to be a lawyer, but you have to have a, around you people, accountants, etc., to take care of this financial fair play uh, section and to enter into the competition. So as you see, and there are more than that, but just because we don't have the, the full day to talk about that, you see that I've said about 10 or 12 different possibilities of being a sport lawyer within sports law. And of course, there is the litigation on the national level, that's fair, but we are talking about international level. In AFC, African Football Confederation, you have seen the final of the Champions League of Africa with the two, I think it was a Tunisian club or Moroccan club against an Egyptian one. I think that they had a, a, a case there. So this is, this is a case in which you will be in the future, the lawyers of one or another club. Myself, I'm, a, I'm the lawyer of Simba, the Simba from Tanzania. And uh, I would love to have a lawyer from Tanzania there, an in-house lawyer in which I can, which, which room I can share, etc. what I'm doing now before the court of arbitration for sport. So we need people in the inside of the clubs everywhere in, in the, the world. Then you have the Olympics coming now, Olympics. And I'm sure that uh, Tanzania, that uh, uh, Rwanda, Kenya, Burundi, all the East Africa, African countries, we have people, we have athletes going there. And what, what for? What do you want a, a sports lawyer? What sports lawyer is doing in Olympics? Come on. The first step, are you allowed to enter the Olympics or not? I mean, I'm from Kenya. I'm the champion of Kenya, but I failed in the trials. But I want to go to the Olympics. Yeah, but I'm sorry, you fail in trials and then you have the first and second and third one that are going straight to the Olympic game. But you, I'm sorry, you are not because you didn't pass the trials. But I want to go there. So let me try. This is not a case that exists, the one from Kenya, but this case that has existed in Europe with the judoka from Belgium. She was the champion of the world, an Olympic champion, but she failed on the trial. There's only one judoka per um, section. You know, they are section all by weight to 48, to 52, to 56, 64, 68, etc. And she failed, but she was the Olympic champion and also the world champion. And she, she went to the, to the court and said, look, I want to go because it's my right to go. And the court in Europe, the European Court of Art, um, of uh, European Union said, no, this is, and this is an important issue. This is Lex Sportiva, the law of sport, nothing to do with the law of employment. I mean, you might be the champion of the world and the champion, Olympic champion, you, but you are not going there because there are something above you. Your federation, your judo federation of Belgium and the Olympic games allow you only to have one per weight. So I'm sorry, you can't go there, even if you're a champion. So you see, you see that you don't have a right to be there. So this is the first thing, first step. Second step is if you have a case 
I don't want you to have any case, but let's say that Kenya has a case of a 5,000 racer. He elbowed someone and he was is going to be disqualified. Then you will have a special, and we were talking to, about that after when we talk about the Court of Arbitration for Sport, the special Court of Arbitration for Sport in Tokyo with 12 arbitrators there waiting, waiting during one month to help the federations to take a decision and to help, of course, the athletes to take a decision in their favor. You elbow someone, you are disqualified and you were the winner. So you will need somebody quite old, and I'm sorry to say, but quite old, the federations, Olympic federations of all the countries have some people or there in Tokyo or in their own country to take care of any issue that might appear before the Olympics with their own athletes, Olympic athletes. So you see, everywhere you go on sport, professional sport at the highest level, NBA, Champion League of Europe, or the lowest level, could be Olympics, not the lowest, but one level below, or anything that you might have in your own country, amateurs of any sport, you have the full picture of a need of a sports lawyer. Sports law is here and sports law exists thanks to sport, of course, but mostly after that, thanks to sports lawyers that are trying always to discuss, to struggle against unfair decisions. So as a first shot, because if not, I'm going to, to be here for the full day, as I said, first shot, this is an introduction on the practical side of the sports law. Then shortly, the image rights, what the image rights were and what they will be maybe in the future. Image rights, uh, when it comes to team sports or when it comes to individual sports are different. I'm going to talk first on team sports and then individual sports. Team sports, when you sign a contract, basketball, handball, rugby, football, you sign the contract, the label contract. And that contract allows the club to use your image, so you have no rights on your image, while you are playing or training or being within the premises of the club. This is up to the club to use that, and they won't pay you any penny more than what they pay you as salary being the employee of that club. This is the first the second step ahead of this one of the image rights is the image rights as a football player or basketball player or whatever player of a uh, team, a sports team. And then this is not included in the salary and the club must pay you a part if they want to use your image. And what is that image? Is you as a football player for instance, you are not with the shirt of your team, you are not in the training camp, training grounds, you're not playing, you're not in the premises of the club, so you're not in the first step, but you are wearing a shirt. Let's say a white shirt, Real Madrid, but not, not with the logo, just a white shirt. And you are sending the ball with another guy. These can be sold by you to the club and it should be paid. Or you can give it to a company and the company will sell that to the club. This is the second one. And the third step, the third step is whenever you use your, let's say VIP image right. You are not playing, you're just there looking yourself. For instance, there, there was the late Kobe Bryant and uh, Lionel Messi did um, a publicity advertisement with Turkish Airlines and you saw the two of them and you knew of course that they were the two best players in basketball and in football, but they were not 
playing football or basketball. They were just wearing shirts, but not the shirts of, of sport. And this is the third one. Or when somebody is just uh, looking straight with a, a suit and, and saying, look, buy this beverage. This is the third one. So you have the first one, which is included, and it's in the salary, second and third one. Okay. And then individual, individual athletes. The rights is for them. Always for them. Unless, unless they are in a competition. For instance, if you are a tennis man or woman and you are in Wimbledon, while you are playing, this image is not appertaining to you. The image is given to the Wimbledon or Roland Garros or US Open because you are playing there and you will be rewarded by a fee whenever you are going up and up in the tournament. But if you are outside of Wimbledon and Djokovic just won Wimbledon, and let's say that a day after is winning at Wimbledon, he has a beverage from Serbia. I just won the tournament of Wimbledon or the tournament in England. Look, I was helped by this beverage. Then this will go directly to his pocket or to the pocket of this uh, image rights company. And now we have two issues, real issues, real uh, cases that in which one I'm involved in, the other one not. In Uruguay, the national team players of football, which is, uh, I mean, we are talking about uh, Luis Suarez, Cavani, the big players, they are there against their own federation saying, look, the image rights we have is our image rights. We are not talking about a club. They pay salary, but you don't pay us salaries. So whenever you sign something with an image rights company or somebody, or a, a sponsor, we want to have our share. This is the case that is right now in Uruguay. And the other one which I'm not involved is when FIFA is using the image of player for his uh, FIFA tools. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm too old to play uh, a PlayStation and all those kind of, of, uh, of, uh, of games, video games. But there's an issue right now because FIFA used, I remember last year, it was the image of Ibrahimovic. And Ibrahimovic said, no, you have to take that out because I never gave you my approval. So the image rights of the athletes, the players, athletes are much more and much more protected by themselves and by their companies. Why? Because the image of a, a good athlete is worth, a bit, maybe it's much more important, economically speaking, than what is rewarded by his salary or by his tournament fees. So you can see that, you can see that the world of sport is huge. The world of sport needs you. And I think that, uh, yes, 35 minutes out of two hours is too much. And I'm um, expecting to come back with the court of vision for sport in the last shot. And I'm also much more than happy to have any question by uh, everyone of, of you, please now for these two issues or after at the end of the session, up to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. You are a very good timekeeper and we appreciate that. And thank you for the wonderful presentation. So next in, next in line is Alex Luganda. Alex Luganda is yes, an advocate. Uh, Alex, Alex Luganda is an advocate of the High Court of Uganda. He has a master's in law and gas and petroleum studies. Also holds a bachelor's degree from, I think this is Makerere University. He was a postgraduate diploma in sports law from FIFA Zurich. He also has a certificate in football administration and management from FIFA. Certificate in, certificate in mediation and arbitration 
an international from the International Law Institute. And he's, uh, as a professional, he's been a principal partner at Newmark Advocates, National Legal Advisor and Board Member of the Uganda Red Cross Society, the Secretary of the African Red Cross Legal Advisors Forum, a member of the Appeals Tribunal Confederation of African Football in Cairo, Egypt. He's also a football administration and management instructor. These are just of some of the accolades that uh, made us approach him to be our panelist today. There are many more, but uh, for, for the sake of time, we will just invite Alex. Alex, please, yeah, you can talk to us about your presentation in a brief 10 to 15 minutes before we move to the next speaker. Welcome, Alex. Oh, thanks very much, uh, Mokua, and uh, my regards to Professor for an able introduction, quite an able and experienced introduction of the topic on uh, sports law um, in general and uh, the element of um, image rights. And as requested by, by Mokua and the co-host, I will be looking at the component of sponsorship and uh, sports law. What is the relationship? And uh, also very aware that uh, I'm speaking to the Young Lawyers, East African Law Society, Young Lawyers Committee and members, and the other guests that uh, are present for this webinar. Uh, we need also to appreciate from the introductory remarks by Professor that sports as an industry has moved from amateur to professionalism. And the component of professionalism brings out issues of commercialization of sports as an industry. And um, that's why sponsorship becomes a very key component in um, the industry management. Now, I will not get to the basics of definition, because I will not say I'm defining sponsorship, what does it mean? I will skip that for purposes of time and aware of the audience that I'm speaking to. But I'll also tell you that what would be the reasons that would in, in interest a, a potential sports sponsor to come on board. Um, the issues of building awareness. A, a brand or a sponsor could be interested in building awareness about his or their products to the market. They may also be interested in attracting new sponsors. So they come into sports as a way of tapping into new markets for their goods and products. Uh, companies or entities may want to breathe new life into failing brands. Um, they, they may have a brand that is struggling on the market, and in their estimation, if they came into rugby in a given country and sponsored rugby as a sport, after studying the dynamics and behavior of the rugby fans, then they could be sure that the brand, a given brand, will be brought back to life. But also important to note is the element of corporate social responsibility. So a number of um, entities and companies come into sports for corporate social responsibility purposes. Now, as a lawyer, as a young lawyer, or a person involved in uh, legal business, just like a professor has hinted, that in the beginning, everybody thought sports was just normal normal business, people just come, play, relax. But over time, we are appreciating that it's a very huge industry with so many complex issues that require lawyers as, um, as a profession. But also to put you to notice that sports law is a body of law in its own right. Although it is a combination of so many other branches of law, like contract law, privacy law, data protection laws, and competition laws, among others. But sports law is a, a peculiar nature of law. And uh, you will appreciate over time by the end of this webinar session and with your other continued research that there are so many components that are kind of peculiar when you come to sports law as opposed to the general body of law. Now, who, who are the parties to a sponsorship agreement is one element we must look at. We have on one side the sponsors, and then on the other side, we have people we call the rights holders. 
And these rights holders are the people who are selling something to the sponsor. Uh, rights holders could be uh, governing bodies. Like uh, in Uganda, we have FUFA. FUFA is the governing body for football. We have the Netball Federation in case of netball, the rugby union for rugby. Now, these governing bodies are what we would call rights holders. You could also have event organizers. In the, in the instance that you're having a one-off uh, competition, the event organizer could be a rights holder. So when a sponsor is coming, they engage with this event holder. You have clubs, football clubs in their own rights. Um, are right holders and they can have products they sell. So many products, uh, they give you examples of, uh, of uh, Manchester United, even our local teams like here in Uganda, you have an official shirt sponsor, you have a stadium sponsor, you have a kids sponsor, you have um, a tie sponsor, you have a kids supplier, official banking partner, official insurance partner, official medical partner. Each of these partners comes up to grab one product or the other, which the rights holder owns. And for individual games, the authorities themselves, the individual authorities are the rights holders for purposes of determining parties. Then we also have broadcast rights owners or broadcasters. For instance, um, like the league in Uganda, the top tier league, the Uganda Premier League, can sell off its broadcast rights to another entity. Now that entity, if it's negotiating with um, a sponsor who comes as a third party, then they become the rights holders in that uh, respect. Now, <clears throat> we as lawyers, we know that a sponsorship agreement, for example, is kind of the same as the normal contracts. You would want to say so. But for purposes of sports law, you need to identify certain fundamentals, key issues that you must identify when you've been approached as a lawyer for any of the two sides, either a sponsor or the rights holder. And I'm going to go through eight key issues briefly because of the time factor just like professor yuan said this element of sports law even sponsorship alone if we are going to study could take a whole week before we exhaust all the components that are involved in sports sports law and sponsorship but i'll look at eight issues for for brevity purposes the first element you have to address your mind to are the sponsors rights so why is somebody coming to bring in money? What are they looking for? And I will tell you, uh, for the experience I've had for the last about 13 years, when I've been dealing with, uh, with, with, with sports law issues and sponsorship, is category ex exclusivity. A sponsor will always look for exclusivity, either for a product, and I say if I'm dealing in um, I'm a, I'm a telecom company, like in Uganda, I'm Airtel, and I'm going to sponsor your club or your netball federation. I would not want any other direct competitor dealing in the same product. Uh, it could also be territorial exclusivity, because there are certain competitions like World Cup competitions um, th th that take the whole continent, that are affecting the whole continent. So you may have a given region of Asia has a sponsor who is sponsoring the World Cup event for like for football and is saying over this territory, jurisdictional territory, I have exclusivity and it's how I'm getting on board. So you as a lawyer, you must be in position to advise your client, the rights holder or the sponsor when they're getting into such an arrangement of sponsorship. The other element that you need to guard out against is the concept of ambush marketing. Now, ambush marketing, because the, 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 the sponsor is looking for exclusivity, but then there are third parties who may come and enjoy certain rights that you have already given out per se by imitating and carrying out 
marketing activities which create an impression in the public that they are maybe the, 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 the right failures. Because an example arose during the 2014 World Cup, the 2014 Brazil World Cup. Because for example, Coca-Cola was the official sponsor of, uh, of, of the 2014 World Cup. But then Pepsi Cola, who is uh, a direct competitor of Coca-Cola, at the same time undertook promotional activities using some players like uh, Lionel Messi, who were participating in the World Cup, and they took out these promotional activities even in the territory of Brazil, where the, the World Cup was uh, being hosted. Now, this element created confusion to some, uh, where Pepsi, although not uh, the official sponsor of Coca-Cola, was using ingenuity and uh, thinking outside the box, I would like to say, if not underhand method, to tap into uh, the brand at the right time and, and uh, opportunity. So if you're a lawyer and you're advising a client, you need to make sure that you introduce clauses that will safeguard the parties against the danger of ambush marketing. For example, you'd look at elements of registration and enforcement of intellectual property, such that you know that uh, these states of, 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 of rights, of trademarks, need to be legally protected, such that should anybody come and engage, pass off, or abuse the same using any other methods, you have them already covered. You could also engage and advise to do what they call awareness campaigns, to make sure that you are letting the whole public know that this is the official partner I'm dealing with. Uh, because of time, you'll, you'll permit me, uh, I will be rushing through these elements to be in position to also give you time to ask questions and my other panelists say something. The other key issue you must advise if you're a lawyer is the sponsorship fees. Uh, and this is a very key element when it comes to, to sponsorship agreements. And uh, sponsorship fees usually, most rights holders want them to be front-loaded. Front-loaded means that they want them to be paid before the start of the event. And that's usually even for one of, one of uh, sports events or if they are short-term short contracts. If they are longer term contracts, usually the sponsorship fees will be scattered and paid in installments or upon events happening, maybe at the beginning of the season, mid season, and something of the kind. But it's also very important for you to, to, to know that sometimes this sponsorship can be in kind. It's not always about money. At times, the sponsorship fees can be paid in kind in form of kits or equipment. Uh, like in Uganda, we have instances where we've had um, um, sponsors come to sponsor the national team, for instance. And then they announce at the press conference that they have given sponsorship worth a 2 billion shillings. Ugandan currents, maybe for a period of three years. But then you discover that 60% of the 2 billion sponsorship is in kind. They are going to say we are going to run adverts, promotional materials, ABCD. So if you're a lawyer and you're advising your rights holder, before the, the, the rights holder gives away all the rights in one bunch, and at the end of the day receives very minimal payments in terms of cash, which can be in position to facilitate other activities of the club, you need to understand how this has been structured out. Um, also, you need to note if you're advising, for example, the sponsor, um, is this sponsorship fee tied to given parameters like performance? Because if I'm paying you money and your football club, for example, you are in the top tier league, and then you're relegated to the lower league, are we going to be giving you the same amount of money that we were paying you then? So if you're a lawyer and you're advising um, a sponsor, you need to take all these issues into consideration. Um, because of time, I, I, I'm just going to say, allow me run to the next consideration or issue that you need to be very uh, acquainted with as a lawyer.
That is the element of expiry and termination of the sponsorship agreement. Now, as a lawyer, the moment your client invites you for a discussion about a potential sponsor, your mind must be in position to move on a journey up to the end of that contract. And, and that's when you'll be doing justice to, to your client in the negotiation of a sponsorship agreement. So as you start negotiations, you look at elements like the right to renew. So if the contract, for example, is for five years, then you must know that you provide for time frame for renegotiation prior to the end. Don't wait for the contract to end, and then after five years, you, be, you press the panic button. And six months to the edge in negotiations, but also put a rider that if within three months, in those six months, you would not arrive at an agreement to renew, then you will be as a rights holder free to contact a third party who will be interested in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in taking up these uh, rights. Then the other element you also need to, 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 to know why, why, for example, uh, is it important for you to provide for those safeguards if you're a lawyer advising, uh, for example, a sponsor. Over time, your sponsorship builds a brand and builds goodwill. So you would not want to move out of the market or, or move out of the market, then your competitor comes and takes over the goodwill that you have been in position to generate over time. So you have to be uh, careful about all those considerations. The other fifth element that you need to advise your client if you're discussing a sponsorship agreement is the element of intellectual property. And the intellectual property has been discussed in detail by by, by uh, Professor John, uh, I will not dwell so much on it. But then you must know that sometimes there are logos and trademarks that you own as a right holder. For example, in Uganda, we have the Premier League. The Premier League owns, Football Premier League owns its own logo. So if they, if they give naming rights of the top tier league to another entity like in Uganda, Star Times, that means you're going to jointly use the trademark between start times and you as the league owner. So at the end of the contract, when the sponsorship agreement expires, who takes over ownership of this joint used trademark, among other things? Because we have uh, had a discussion by a professor on the other elements of, uh, of uh, trademarks and uh, image rights, allow me not to go so much in detail, but that's one element you need to take cognizance of as a sports lawyer. Then uh, as I conclude the other issue, number six, you look at what we call morality clauses. Morality clauses are also very pertinent because if you're a sponsor of, of um, an entity of rights holder, you will be interested that those persons you're sponsoring, be they individual authorities or clubs, do not engage in activities which bring disrepute to your image and branding. So when you're a lawyer and you're advising, you need to take very key um, attention to morality clauses. For example, we had issues of uh, Tiger Woods and uh, Oscar Pistorius in South Africa, the former Olympian. And you're all aware when they went through the turbulent times that they have been through, what has happened to their sponsorships and rating? Most of them dropped. Some of them were even sued by uh, different uh, uh, sponsors because of bringing the names of the sponsors into disrepute. Uh, the other element you need to be very careful about as a sports lawyer are regulatory challenges. So if you're, if you're advising uh, your, your client who is a rights holder, before they sell the products, you must tell them what can they be in position to sell. For example, in Uganda, and it is the same instance around the world, FIFA does not allow national teams to have shirt sponsors. So if you're a lawyer advising a national team uh, about a given sponsor, 
while a club can easily, a football club or a rugby club, maybe may easily sell the shirt, the front part of their shirt to a shirt sponsor, it may not be possible to the national team. So, you, like in Uganda, the instance we have, so you need to be very careful. Uh, like calf competitions, for example, for all our sponsors, local sponsors of the Uganda League and the clubs, when they go into calf organized competitions, you can't move with your sponsors. So at the time of contract negotiation, you may want to appease the potential sponsors and tell them, you know, a big team, we are going to play continental football, we shall take your brand around the whole of Africa. But then that may not be possible. So as a lawyer, you must be very, very cognizant of the regulatory challenges before you go ahead. And finally, because of the time, I have only one minute to finish, um, is the element of uh, force majeure. The, the occurrence of COVID-19 and the pandemics right now have thrown a new angle. We've had sports competitions played halfway, others not completed. And like there are some countries, even Uganda, where you have battles between the, the, the rights holders like clubs and the sponsors. The sponsor is saying, I can't give you all the money as per the sponsorship agreement because you didn't complete the league. You didn't play all the 300 games that you told me you're going to play. And then the contracts themselves did not provide for payment being paid on the number of games played. So what happens in the circumstances? So if you are devising, you need to ensure that you provide within the sponsorship agreement what to do in the case of unforeseen events. Uh, we had a scenario of uh, the SARS outbreak in 2013 and certain uh, competition owners went into insurance. It's a new component that is happening in Europe which is pandemic insurance. We don't, we don't have it this side of, of, of Africa, such that you know that you, as a sports body, you're insuring against a pandemic. So that in the unforeseen event that it occurs, then you're not running bankrupt. You have certain buffer that you've protected uh, to ensure that it helps you pass through the whole process. So thank you very much, uh, the, the, the hosts and uh, my colleagues, the panelists. Because of time, I think we can't go on and on and on, but it has been uh, a very good beginning. We know we can carry through from there. Thank you very much, Alex, for the presentation. Thank you so much. So we'll be moving on to Mr. Dennis Lukambi. Mr. Dennis Lukambi is an advocate of the Republic of Uganda. Uh, sorry for the mishap. Uh, up next, we have Mr. Dennis Lukambi, who is an advocate of the Republic of Uganda. He's the head of the legal department of the Federation of Uganda Football Association since 2015. He was recently awarded a diploma in football law by the International Center for Sports Studies and FIFA. Oh, my colleague Brenda is off. I think I can take the floor for purposes of time. Uh, thank you much, very much, uh, members or the panelists and the colleagues here, especially the East African uh, young lawyers. Brenda was still on the process of uh, initiating me, but I think for purposes of time, I would proceed. If all is well. Yeah, in this regard, uh, as my senior colleague uh, 
Alex mentioned, we try to dissect and I was given the honor to try and explain the time I've been uh, working in the Federation, especially football, which is one of the prominent games in the world. The challenges that we have faced as far as sports law is concerned. As you mentioned, I've been in the Federation uh, for the last five years, six years, and I've been basically practicing and very busy as far as enforcing the elements in the game of football. And I've been consulted by my colleagues in other federations, especially team sport federations. But the challenge I've faced so far, one of the greatest challenges, as Professor mentioned, that uh, in Europe, they had moved ahead of us. They have moved a step far, far ahead of us, and we are on the taking on step as far as East Africa is concerned. And we don't differ so much. Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, we almost face the same challenges. And to me, in my experience, the greatest challenge has always been that we, the, the, the legal fraternity, the powers that are, the judiciary, the members of the bar, the bench, most of them who make critical decisions are still seeing sports as a, in a traditional way, view of being recreational. They have not dissected the element of sport being a commercial business. We have not yet moved to the industry of commercialization of sport. And when you read reports, for example, recently FIFA published a report on international transfer of players. The world, the money exchanged in there was almost 7 billion US dollars, almost half of Ugandan budget being moved in sport. At the federation where I work at FUFA, but in a few years ago in 2013, the budget was 4 billion. Now we are talking about 40 billion. So the best is the game has moved. It's a commercial business. It's highly commercialized. And after being commercialized, you realize that there are challenges to it in terms of employment, in terms of dispute resolution, sponsorship, marketing, investment. Now the greatest challenge is we don't have sufficient laws to protect or to resolve these disputes. Lack of these regulations or rules in sport has affected the procedures as we operate in. For example, Sometimes we go to court and we, what we can argue are facts because we don't have unique kind of aspects that can solve resolve the disputes in sport. You try to cite uh, precedents from international sports associations for arbitration like a CAS, our courts will not entertain it. They are not well conversant with that. They will prefer getting a, a decision from England, High Court of England, but they will not be comfortable to get a decision, a precedent from CAS. And then we try to advise that this is highly litigated, but they won't accept. Then you find that you are in court, for example, you, the only thing you can add your facts. Professor mentioned about employment of players. These are unique type of aspects that the national employment laws cannot resolve. Legislation of a player, transferring players, they are not provided for anywhere in our Employment Act, for example, in Uganda. And it happens all areas. So the fact is that we lack the unique aspects, we lack the laws that can either protect the game, the sport, or even protect the commercial element of sport. And I'll highlight a few areas. We mentioned about, for example, employment. We still have some lawyers who still take, for example, employment matters for players, courts of law. And you all know we have, our courts have unlimited jurisdiction. So the judge will be able to entertain that kind of dispute. Unfortunately, by the time the court passes a decision, the contract is sometime back expired and they can't provide a solution to it. It's the judicial, the arbitration bodies that try to resolve that. Check it issues of uh, sponsorship. Sometimes we've been in court and courts cannot interpret the damages as far as sponsorship is concerned because you have element where you have to prove damages before the court can award. And you can't really understand if a sponsor is canceled out, a sponsorship deal is canceled out to prove that damages. Remember, sometime we have, we in Africa, we had an issue with Morocco rejecting to organize the AFCON because of Ebola. CAS immediately came in and then introduced the element. They discussed and dissected the issue of damages. And you realize that from their experience, 
if European experience or the experience, they could come to a dissolution and the damages were reduced. Issues of taxation, we still have elements of taxation. If a player is employed, a Ugandan player is employed in Kenya, for example, which is another East African country, maybe we could have the concessions. But if he goes out of the country, he finds his tax on employment. If he comes home, still it's taxed. So that kind of double taxation, those are the elements that we don't have a way of resolving it. You are able of Uganda will easily come in and they will need to, for them, they need, for example, they are cut and you can't resolve it because you can't cite any law in Uganda, for example, inviting them to address the mind on the issue that the player has been paying taxes where he was and then in Uganda. So the challenge is there are those exemptions that are not available. Events management. Sometimes uh, too far, I'm not my talking about football because that's where I've been working and I am so much with uh, my colleagues in basketball and other team sport. You organize a national team game and some entities are streaming the game live. The only solution you have at that moment, for example, is to go and get an injunction. There is no other protection you have. By the time you apply to court so law for an injunction, the game is already done and you really it's hard to prove all those damages. Some of these things have been criminalized in some countries, especially in Europe and Asia. You can't go and take OB van to uh, for example, broadcast a game when you don't have rights to it. The police will even move in immediately and help to resolve and reduce the damage. In Uganda, you either use force or you may not have that protection from the police. The other element, if the game we are talking about commercialization, you will not have laws in East Africa that are protecting the game. We have serious vices that are affecting sport. The major one now, which is always giving everybody a headache, is much fixing what we refer to as predetermination of results. What always brings the fun to the game or to watch sport is basically the unpredictability of results. The day the fans or the fans get to know who will win any kind of sport, you will not see them again on the pitch or to support their, their, their clubs or athletes. So much fixing in East Africa is becoming really beyond our means. We need the cooperation of governments, national police, national entities to help. You can't cap it alone because normally uh, what happens in associations is that your rules always uh, stop on your members. For example, in, in, in football, participants in the game cannot, are not allowed to do uh, to involve in betting. It's on, but now you realize that the guys who are influencing results in these games are not part of you, they are not players, they are not coaches, they are referees. They are even outside betting companies. So countries like UK, China, Korea, and most countries in Europe, the police, government bodies, government officials, they come in immediately. They are in hands with sports governing bodies to resolve this kind of disputes. We had a scenario recently where one of our agent or Ugandan agent was arrested in Kenya, being involved in match fixing. But when he was arraigned before court, you couldn't prove anything, neither corruption, neither. The issue was, court was asking, what did you do? I can't understand. And then he was left off the hook. So we need those laws. The more these laws are, are lacking that are unique in sport, we still have those challenges going on. And doping the definition of that doping, you may not find it in our East African laws, national laws. It's basically guided by World Anti-Doping Organization. So countries, especially East African countries, need to be involved. I know our colleagues in Kenya have moved a bit ahead, but even in Uganda, we try to initiate the national doping organizations under the Ugandan Olympic Committee. But still, players, we can talk about it outside the field, but inside, we know there are issues that still need to be resolved. Governments have to be involved as far as doping, match fixing, and hooliganism itself. We saw in UK, I was reading an article where me as stepping on the, on, on the turf, it's become it's a criminal. So governments have moved in to resolve uh, hooliganism by making it criminal. And criminal it means police and other authorities have to move in to work with, together with the sports uh, uh, governing bodies. Unlike uh, in East Africa, you find that there's chaos at the stadium, 
And the federations, what they can do is to try and resolve work with their participants, players, coaches, referees, but the fans, it's hard to regulate to them unless you need another force to come in and help you out, to kind of resolve those kind of disputes. So the major challenge is that we have, we have agreed, as Professor mentioned and Alex, that the game of sport has evolved. And that evolution is highly commercialized. Now we need their unique laws that really need to resolve the disputes and protect the game of sport. We no longer rely on the other substantive laws. The traditional view, a professor, professor mentioned it some time back, we could only rely on the professional, on the substantive laws, employment laws, labor laws, tax laws to resolve the disputes in sport. Right now, sport is unique. The areas need to be handled unique, such that we, the, the precedents that are set are solving the problems unique to sport. We can no longer rely on other substantive laws as that was mentioned. The second one is about dispute resolution. Since I've been the federation, we had almost 50 cases in courts of law resolving about employment of players, sponsorships, disciplinary, whatever happens, uh, my colleagues here, lawyers and other litigants, they always learn to courts of law, but it has not provided results, it has not provided solutions to it. It's sometimes it is slow. By the time the matter is resolved, the matter is already taken off by an event. It's already uh, taken over by an event. Player, the contract already expired, the game already finished. So those elements that uh, need to be resolved it needs a special kind of arrangement. If we could appreciate, I was reading that Kenya at least have the sports tribunal, which is national where appeals from sports governing bodies uh, appealed to the sports tribunal. I'm not aware of Tanzania, but Uganda, we are not yet there. Normally after the disputes resolved by federations, some litigants always rush to go courts of law. Others, they have not appreciated the curse because of the money elements. And then others try to go to FIFA, but still their first direction is always courts of law. And it has really affected us, not only the federation of sport or football, but even other federations. Any dispute always ends up in courts of law. So that's the best challenge that uh, until we understand in East Africa that we need dispute resolution chambers which are national with experience to resolve those matters, then we'll always be uh, giving precedents that are not necessary. If you're in courts of law, for example, you find that transferring a player from Uganda to Italy, our local courts of law cannot resolve. So we need a national dispute that at least from the point of negotiation, from the point of decision making, the parties know where to go. So there are so many challenges, but because of time, we need to address our minds so much on the law. And as a fraternity, we need to lobby our litigants, legislature, to try and come in to resolve and appreciate. Because other industries, mining, taxation, and other areas, they have been oil and gas in Uganda, for example, they have got their specialized laws catering for those kind of arrangements. So it's time now we need this kind of laws in sport to resolve the disputes in sport specifically. Um, cool, I don't know what I'm, I'm doing on time. If I save more time. Yes, Dennis, I think you are, actually your time is up. Maybe you Thanks. can wind up. Thank you. Yeah, so in my concluding remarks, it's about that uh, we need to, lawyers who are interested in participating in this kind of uh, economy of court sport, we need to move together. That when we go to court, for example, we need to lobby about these sports laws that we are talking about. And it's a campaign normally we are learning with in Uganda, to lobby for national, for the parliament and powers that are, to try and appreciate that the game has moved, it's highly commercialized, but that we have these unique laws that can resolve sports disputes. Otherwise, when we go to court, Unless we are going to add facts, the current laws cannot resolve the disputes that we have in the sport because highly commercialized. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dennis. Uh, so our last speaker of the day is Ms. Janet Katisia. Janet is an advocate of the High Court of Kenya with more than 15 years experience in sports and commercial law. She's the owner and senior counsel 
or at Janet Katisia, an associate advocate, a firm that specializes in, among many areas, sports law and conveyancing. She's a mediator, arbitrator, and a sports compliance and a compliance sports lawyer. She also serves as the vice chair of the FIFA Independent Disciplinary Appeals Committee. She's a committee member of on FIFA Ethics Committee. She serves. Uh, she's also served as a reform ta task force member for FIFA CAF, uh, FIFA Stroke CAF between September 2019 and 2020 which sought to reform CAF in the areas of good governance, financial management, and internal procedures. Um, the, she's the vice chair of FKF uh, Appeals Committee. Uh, she served as the vice chair, rather, between 2016 and 2019, and she also holds a master's in sports law. Welcome, Janet. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with the colleagues, friends, and prof. Nice to see you again, as always. Um, for me, I was requested to speak about uh, dispute resolution. I think that's the core business as advocates and lawyers. So how can we move these skills that we have into the realm of sports? We've been told sports is a bit unique. So how do we manage to participate? Because disputes are there, they have to be resolved. Maybe just to uh, one thing about sports disputes that need to be appreciated is that, first of all, more often than not, it's a global, the parties are global. It's not necessarily just somebody from your country. So the question is, if it is a foreigner, which law are you using? If your client is in a foreign country, which law are you using? You know, for us lawyers, jurisdiction is always the beginning point. These matters, most of them are financially significant. When you hear the numbers that uh, they talk about in the contracts, you talk about billions and millions. So nobody wants to lose money. They are time sensitive and cost sensitive because uh, first and foremost, we know most of these uh, disputes, especially when it comes to employment, if the season has changed or the transfer window is closed, your decision or whatever you're fighting for might just get lost. So you need something that is very quick to settle all these things. Further, we need consistency and uniformity among the whole industry. So the standards that we use in Kenya, the standards in Uganda, need to be the same standards that our players will, will be able to enjoy, whether they go to Spain or they go to Greece or they go to Russia. That is the joy and the element of sports. So everything has to be the same. So how do we do this? And uh, also we have discussed now about the financial and the commercial aspects. Most parties will want this to remain confidential. Nobody will want this uh, to be brought, the, the key points of their contracts to be broadcast to the whole world when they are not ready for it. So what is the preferred method of resolving disputes? It's alternative disputes resolution. This does not mean that we, completely cut off the, law, the normal court system, but it is preferred to use the alternative disputes, whether it be arbitration or mediation. So maybe I can talk about the elements of sports disputes. I think as a practitioner, the first thing you need to first uh, assess when an issue comes before you is whether it is a sports issue. Sports issue can have different parties or different players or stakeholders. You can have a matter affecting the player themselves against the club owner, against the, the, the federation, against the officials. You can have a dispute with club owners, a dispute involving the officials, a dispute also involving federations. This especially happens like when the International Federation gives a sanction. I think last year Haiti had that situation in Kenya were almost in football being relegated for non-compliance. Sometimes there are disputes between sponsors, a commercial dispute, but a, a sports-related uh, sports one between agents. So there are very many parties or players or situations where sports law will apply. So there is a wide range of, of areas where as practitioners, we can assist our, our clients. Then of course, what kind of cases are these? We've uh, heard today that sports covers a huge range of uh, of uh, conventional law uh, structure and law systems that we have in place. But 
sometimes the interpretation and how it is being uh, interpreted and applied may be a little nuanced and different. So there are various cases that come under sports law. So we can have governance issues where which discuss about uh, following of the regulations. There is issues of uh, club licensing. If your club is not licensed or does not comply with the regulations of the federations or confederations, definitely you're not able to participate in competitions. So that is a kind of dispute that needs to be resolved. Right now, we are having, in a raising an alarming way, uh, increase of human rights violations, especially sexual harassment, racism, and discrimination. So these are also disputes that uh, these uh, tribunals and uh, committees have to handle. We have employment, it's been mentioned here. The commercial contracts themselves, uh, sometimes it's advantageous to you to argue them before a tribunal which is competent uh, so that they're dealt with faster and in, in light of the nuances of sports industry. We have the activities that go on on the pitch. Anything that arises from the field, those are disciplinary issues. So these have to be determined according to the code of, of the, the rules of the game and the code that, of that sport. So you need, this is also an area where as practitioners, we are able to give some, uh, some support. There is ethical uh, cases that come about. Myself, I sit in the FIFA ethics uh, committee, and uh, this is where we try to make sure that there is integrity in the sport because without integrity, sports really loses its meaning. And the key element of sports is fairness, and ethics really helps to, to enforce this. Um, another aspect, uh, when you are dealing with the sport disputes, as I've mentioned, the key thing is jurisdiction. Where do you take your matter? How do you file it? Who is going to listen to it? So in the matters of uh, jurisprudence, of jurisdiction, as a practitioner, you have to assess the situation. Right now, I must say we have a lot of uh, options. It's like a web in, in uh, Kenya and in Africa because it's not yet so structured as it is in Europe. But I think uh, this kind of uh, interaction we're having now and, and involvement, we are really going to streamline this. So you have to, as a practitioner, after seeing what matter you have before you, does your organization or your federation or your national organization have an internal mechanism? Because as we are aware, even uh, in our local jurisdictions, you have to exhaust your local, your internal mechanisms first before you're able to go externally. So as a practitioner, you need to understand the landscape of how uh, matters are to be determined from the internal mechanisms, the appeals there, is there a national dispute resolution chamber? Are we going to go to CAS directly? Is this a matter that needs to go to an international organization because it has an international element? So these are the, or do you go to the sports dispute tribunal? I think this is the biggest challenge for many practitioners because if you start on the wrong route, sometimes you waste a lot of time and you don't achieve the required or desired result. And don't forget time is money and critical in sports. So this is one thing as a practitioner, you need to be very clear on when you're making uh, such decisions. Also the issue of place in terms of physical place, which is advantageous to your clients. It depends whether you're acting, which side you're acting for. Sometimes it's advantageous for you to make sure the matter goes to the farthest court possible. But sometimes you want it to be nearer and locally, especially if you're acting for the players or the clubs. So you need to be to be able to know uh, where is the physical location, especially when you want a physical hearing. Then you, the goodness nowadays, uh, organizations like us, they have uh, uh, they have offices all over the world. You don't necessarily need to go to Switzerland. You can choose, you can opt to have your matter in Egypt, you can opt to have it in another location except going to, to, to Switzerland. Because as we know, travel, especially from Africa, is not that easy. Um, of course, even when you're determining where you're going to do your matter, you, it's, whether it's the, uh, the both parties are local is a determinant, whether there was an arbitral clause in that contract, and uh, whether there is an international element or an international party, you see now that will help you know where exactly you need to go. 
Um, even when you're deciding uh, which place to go, you must know that some matters can be mediated on and not. For instance, like uh, we don't mediate on doping matters. Those ones have to go through the the channels that are that are uh, are set in place according to the regulations and statutes. So what this means is that if anybody wants an issue to be determined, or even you need to file a claim, the first question after you've established that there's an issue is where are you going to get it done? Always have the end in mind to know when I get my result, what next? How will I enforce it? Where will I enforce it? Is it practical for me to travel all the way to Switzerland to discuss a contract for 500,000 shillings, Kenya shillings? Or is there another way that I'm able to, to, to sort it out in a cost-effective manner? Take, and most importantly, as I've said, you have to try and exhaust all local options, which include either your internal mechanisms, you use of uh, the CAF committees before you go to FIFA. And all this depends on the nature of the matter that you're having. So as practitioners, we need to get into the rules. And each sport has its own different channels, depending on the infrastructure that they have uh, locally. So maybe if I can touch on the procedure. In the procedure for going through a, media, uh, a dispute resolution is generally the normal procedure for arbitration and mediation. So at the CAS level, you're, you're uh, allowed to choose your panel, just like a normal arbitration. So these are key things. So you wonder why is it important? Because you want some people who are knowledgeable and people who are balanced and who will hear your case in a fair way. So choice of panels of the panel of arbitrators is also important. This also comes in, this is very important for you as a practitioner and also you need to be strategic about it. As you all know, in arbitration and mediation, the arbitrator is the one who creates the rules of how we are going to proceed. So you need uh, to, they will help you determine whether it's going to be written or you're going to have it oral interviews. Are you going to do it online? Are you going to give witness oral evidence or are you going to rely on statements? So as a practitioner, you have to make sure that the, the procedure that is being used is beneficial to you. Maybe something I'd like to mention about this uh, kind of disputes, especially outside the national jurisdiction, is the issue of, of translation and interpretation. Sometimes our, our clients, especially when it comes to players, when they go to a foreign country, they are forced to enter contracts which may be in a foreign language and using a foreign, in a foreign language. So when you come to the courts, if you want the, the matter in English, it means everything has to be translated. Sometimes things are lost in translation, literally, and it may or may not be advantageous to you. So when you are choosing uh, the plays, the other panelists, you also need to look at the language factor uh, when doing that. The, the issues of fees and costs. There are standard fees that need to be paid in the different levels. Like for instance, in Kenya, in the FKF appeals tribunal, if you have um, an appeal, you need to pay a deposit of 100,000 shillings. So you need to confer, confer with your client, see if it is beneficial to actually go through that whole process. More often than not it is, but those are the kind of things you need to look about, think about. In terms of costs, if you're having a physical uh, session and you're going to go to Switzerland, you know that those are visas, those are hotels, those are transport. So you need to advise your clients uh, properly on this. Uh, another thing to think about is where do you want do you want to start from the end or do you want to have room for appeal? So even your choice of where you're going to go is going, you need to have a long-term plan of how you're going to resolve this case. Uh, when we come to, you have to choose also a, a, a panel where you can get provisionary and conservatory measures such that there is no wastage and a player is able to, is free to do some other things. Because as you said, some of these decisions are very time sensitive. Or even, even if you get an appeal, they will be of no use if you did not have any provisional or conservatory measures. Mm -hmm. Finally, one thing to think about when you're thinking about your dispute is in the end, how are you going to enforce 
whatever decision comes from whichever tribunal or panel. Is it recognized? Are you able, to, which system are you going to use to enforce? So as a practitioner, when you are making this kind of decisions on a dispute, you need to put all these elements in mind and see how you are best able to represent your, your clients. Maybe now we go to another element, which is the relevant laws and rules. Um, as I've mentioned earlier, there are different kinds of claims that can come. They overlap with the normal jurisdiction, but when they are sports related, they become a sports uh, dispute. So as a practitioner, it is very important for you, first of all, <laughs> to know the rules of that game, especially when you are handling disciplinary matters. You must take time to read. Personally, I had to take time to read <laughs> about football and know all the details, even things that I never thought about, because you have to give the correct advice. For our players, this is life and death. You can ruin a career. If somebody doesn't play in a final, the consequences can be very dire to their career. So as a practitioner, it's up to you to be competent enough and to know the rules of the game to know the procedures and to give your best representation for this person that you are working with. I have to understand that you need to, to acquaint yourself with the International Federation statutes together with the local ones and uh, the caste regulations. Basically, you need to know the whole framework of how everything works. In uh, Kenya, we have a unique situation because of a sports dispute tribunal whereby we apply both national and international uh, rules. So as a practitioner, you need to be a little bit savvy to know what will apply and what will bring an advantage to your clients at which particular time. So for instance, if we are discussing a contract between players, if your organization has a player status committee, that's the best place to have it resolved. It will be prompt, the standards are known, and it's easily enforceable. But uh, as my colleagues from Uganda have said, as lawyers, we are always rushing to the employment court. In the employment court, the standards are different. So it makes it very, very uh, confusing, even for you when you're making your contracts, which is the best way to move. That is why, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we need to make it a habit to nominate that, that all disputes will be handled through ADR using the internal mechanism and where there's no internal mechanism, at least we have to make sure that the international standards apply. That way, there is consistency, there is a, and then people can know it is predictable. It's not like every day, it's like the rules are changing. The rules of the game are changing. That makes our, our, our sports industry very, very unstable and unattractive. So it is important that uh, we look for some way to merge our national laws and international laws. Uh, I believe in other jurisdictions, what they've done while respecting national laws, they also appreciate that there is a unique element of uh, Lex Sportiva, which is the sports law. So I think that's one thing maybe as uh, East African countries, we need to embrace in our statutes so that it's easy to maneuver and we have become attractive internationally, because as I've mentioned, sports is a, is a global thing. Um, um, now, maybe I can also try and discuss briefly about uh, national tribunals. So national tribunals, they can come in various forms. So we have like what we have in Kenya, which is a sports dispute tribunal, which is formed under our judiciary, under our judicial system. So when it is formed our judicial system, we know first of all their allegiance to the constitution of Kenya. So where that come, where sometimes there can be a conflict between the sports rules and the constitution. And therein lies a bit of an issue. Even there can be a conflict between our national rules and the sports rules. So this is where maybe we need to see some bit of uh, balance and integration. So when such a place is made, uh, ideally, for organizations that have internal mechanisms, the Sports Dispute Tribunal has been very strong and uh, appreciated and recognized. But where there is nothing is where they stand in. And I think they are very important. Uh, and it's a very important not to have a gap and not to have a lacuna where players 
and club owners have no redress and are forced to go to the mainstream court system, which will not be able to, to resolve their, their, their disputes. Like in Kenya, it's under section 55 of the Sports Act is when they are, are established and their jurisdiction is under section 58. So the Sports District Tribunal, it says that anyone who wants to go there is welcome. Anybody who submits to their jurisdiction is welcome. What this means is that if you have no alternative, at least you have somewhere to go. Secondly, they can handle the appeals from the internal mechanisms. So it's up to organizations and with our help as practitioners to guide on a good way and a speedy way that will make sure that real conflicts are ended in a most cost-effective and fair manner. Um, it does, SDT also handles appeals from decisions of the sports registrar, which is very important now that they are the ones in charge of basically all registration of sports organizations. And uh, basically, if you have a contract and you wish to, to put uh, the, the court of the sports district tribunal as the arbitrator, that's fair enough. And this removes you from the mainstream judicial system and at least matters are able to be concluded faster and with people who have some knowledge and skill in sports. Um, as I've said, the challenge with the sports district tribunal comes, especially when we are dealing with an international element. So how do you enforce a Kenyan decision in, an interna in a different jurisdiction, even in our neighbor, Uganda? How are we going to be able to, to, to enforce such a decision? So that's why there is what is called the National Dispute Resolution Chambers. These are uh, tribunals that are formed in accordance with the CAS regulations and the international federations. What this means is that the structure is similar to that one of CAS, although they sit locally. So the advantage of that kind of a system is that those decisions are recognized internationally. So enforcement is a little bit uh, easier and better. Personally, I've never understood why our region does not have our own uh, national dispute resolution chambers, whether through CAF or through FIFA, so that our players and our teams don't really need to keep on traveling or going so far, having to engage expensive advocates to handle matters that really can be determined in a speedy manner within our jurisdiction. I believe with the interest we are seeing right now, uh, the number of practitioners is going quite on the rise. We have excellent competent people like my fellow speakers. And I think it's time that African lawyers get involved in African sports. So that's uh, on the national tribunal. So we can have both ways, but it's good if we, if we try and make sure that whatever we put in place is competent and recognized and follows international standards. That way it becomes attractive and uh, even people doing business in Africa are sure and guaranteed of a speedy resolution. Uh, one of the main threats to sports, apart from match fixing, as has been mentioned, is doping. Doping uh, has been taken as a very serious element and is integrated in all sports. All, all sports have the anti-doping policies and they comply with the World Anti-Doping Agency because the element of sports is fairness and you, it's not fair if somebody has an advantage over somebody else. One thing I'll say about uh, anti-doping is that first of all, as a practitioner, you will need to acquaint yourself with the code, the WADA code acquaint yourself with the international standards because it is quite technical and one small element can save your player or it can ruin your player. Matters of doping mostly are strict liability. So it's like you've almost no defense. My personal view is that uh, most people are caught up in these uh, violations, mostly out of ignorance or uh, lack of knowledge on how to handle themselves and protect themselves. So it's very, as, as practitioners, this is an area where we can be of great use to guide uh, our clients, whether they are practitioners, uh, their players, the clubs. 
to just make sure that they comply. Because the consequences of this is becoming expensive. I think we've seen Kenya has been cited quite a bit of time in the recent years. And I think uh, we need to stop this so that our players can have a bright future. Um, doping Janet, cases. Maybe we can, Janet, maybe we can, we can wrap up in two minutes. Yes, yes. So I'd like to say that the doping uh, matters are handled by the sports dispute tribunal. Just to wrap up, I would like to encourage all practitioners that this area is an exciting area. It uh, has a lot of opportunities. It is we lawyers are needed here on a very serious note. Maybe some of the things you need to have as a practitioner, you need to be creative. You need to be knowledgeable. You need to have integrity to be passionate and versatile and be a problem solver, a deal maker, and a confident. With this, which I'm sure we have amongst ourselves, we'll be able to help the sports industry grow and have the impact and the value that sports has in other parts of the world. Thank you. Thank you, Janet, uh, for the wonderful presentation. I will share your slides with everybody who is in attendance. And we appreciate that. Prof, maybe you can have five minutes to talk about arbitration in sports and especially the court of arbitration for sports before we go to the plenary. Thank you. Okay, if there, there's no question, I, I just uh, would like to say that I answer a lot of them through the, to the chat, so most of them have been answered, but the one directed to uh, my fellow colleagues from Africa. And uh, I would like just to, meanwhile, uh, waiting for the, for the question, I would like to say that uh, when Alex was talking about amorph marketing, it's fine because I, I, I do normally a lecture of four hours in the, only ambush marketing, so it's a, a nice topic. Then he said that uh, judges in national courts are not specialists, and that's the problem. That's the problem. When you go to, to, uh, to a court and you face somebody who doesn't know about sport, doesn't care about sport, you are in, a, in a trouble. And uh, for Janet, uh, she's right, Switzerland is uh, not cheap, but you have two possibilities now with CAS. You can go to Egypt, to Cairo, or you can go to Abu Dhabi, there are two uh, places in which CAS has admitted to have uh, a possible hearing. And uh, me, uh, as I had only five minutes, if you let me talk about CAS, because Janet covered most of what I, I was willing to say, but just two or three issues. One, in choosing the arbitrator, you have to, of course, to, to go for the language, but you have to know that E, he or her knows really the language because there are some fake uh, CVs sometimes. Be careful about that. No real lead arbitrator. Then go on and see if he knows or she knows about football or another sport because it depends on the sport. Sometimes you go to someone that is said that he knows about sport, but he knows only about boxing, not about football. And you need a, a football uh, knowledge in the case. Um, first thing. The second thing is a language. You have three official languages from the 1st of July 2020. Spanish has been added. So you have French, English and Spanish. And I was just answering one question of one of the attendants about this. And I said, look, what are the steps to be a sports lawyer in the future? I said, one, you need to have a master in, sport, in sports law. This is absolutely necessary. Why? Because everyone who wants to hire you in a level of FIFA, UEFA, CAF, Commebol, etc., they will need that. They will ask you for the master. And uh, I know that it's very expensive. That's why I'm trying to, to launch uh, in Ghana an African International Sports Law Master in order to have uh, a reduction of the cost, of course, not only the cost, but for the travel cost, but also the, the fees. And that is something that I have in mind for next year. So I, I will let you know, because I think that uh, Africa needs this International Sports Law Master. So languages, if you know English, that's fine. If you know French, that's an adding. If you know Spanish, that's the must. You know, uh, I, I'm, I'm fluent in the three languages and, and that's why I'm uh, requested by a lot of, uh, of clients knowing the three languages. So first, a master in national sport law, second languages. And how do you choose a language when you go to CAS? There may be some tricks. Yes, of course, there are tricks. 
Now the three languages are admissible and they are official. You don't have to, to try to avoid Spanish because Spanish is, is, will be there. So what to do when an Argentinian player is going to, let's say, to Morocco or to Kenya or to uh, Russia, you will have your own language, but also in Spanish. Why, you might say? Because with that Spanish, besides the fact that Janet said that there are some lost in translation sometimes, but you can use then the Spanish language as an official one in the CAS proceedings. So this is also a trick. The same appears if you, you are going to uh, a Kenyan or Ugandan player is going to, uh, let's say, Saudi Arabia it is in uh, Arabic, but also in English, because then you will have the chance to go English. And if it's a French speaking country like uh, Burundi, I, I guess, uh, uh, is a French speaking one, you put it in French and in Arabic, then you have the chance to go. Then you will avoid what? What Janet said, translators. As you know, they said in Italian, traduttore traitore. I mean, it would say that you are a traitor, you are a translator and a traitor, not because you are a traitor by yourself, but because it's difficult to translate when it comes to sport and to sports law. This is totally different. So you have to lecture your translator. Another tip for, for you, and I know that is, is very quick, but uh, normally I lecture on pract practice in, in, the, in the cast for five hours. So it's, it's just a, a small, small uh, tips. Uh, never translate yourself. Please, even if you know the, all the languages of CAS, never translate. Have another one translating for you. It might be a translator or maybe a lawyer from your own office, then you, you will just uh, uh, ask CAS and the opposite party to accept that. Why? Because you can't be aware of everything. You can't be focused and prepared in a hearing and then also translating. It's a mistake. And if you want to uh, avoid cost to your client, this is the, less, the least cost that you want to avoid have a translator. And finally, last but not least, hearing or not hearing? That is the question. Always a hearing. Always, please, always ask a hearing when you go to, to CAS. Never have everything in written and that's all. Because the arbitrators, they will read that, of course, but they won't have the chance to have your, your way to, to, to deal with the case, your, your passionate uh, issues with the case. You, how you can deal and you can uh, make a, a, a witness or make a party or make a, um, an expert fall because you can make a cross-examination difficult for him or her. So yes, and if you have the choice, hearing by being in person or hearing by Zoom or WebEx, etc., please choose the in-person one. It's always better. You will have the arbitrators in front of you, near to you, and it will be much better. I know that the costs are high, but the cost of losing is higher. So that's all. And uh, now we have the questioning. They asked me to stay 15 minutes more, I, 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 will, I will try. So I'm sorry, Mokwa, I, I, I would love to talk much more about CAS, but I need to do at least those three or four topics. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for understanding and thank you for accommodating us for 15 minutes more. Now we will be welcoming questions to the panelists. Prof has, uh, and the panelists have been trying to answer the questions through the Q&A section. However, now this is the opportunity for members and the attendees to raise up your hands so that we can give you the opportunity to speak and direct your questions to the speakers. Thank you. Brenda and I will be heading this plenary. And therefore, you are, you are allowed. Uh, to ask questions. Uh, the question of it put in written, you can also ask them now because uh, there are five or six that have, haven't been answered. I have no time to answer all of them. So you can, they can repeat now directly. Okay. Yes, thank you, Prof. Yeah, I have seen some questions on the Q&A section. Council Luganda, how come Arab teams have shared sponsors from CAF Championship Leagues? And what is your view of the 256 football awards in line up with the U UPL rights? That is Junju Hamza. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Uh, are we getting all questions or you want me to make a response to that? 
you can give a brief response to that before you go to the next. Okay, and a brief response to that. I'll, 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 in respect to the, the example of the Arab Arab teams uh, in CAF, um, I also need further facts on that because uh, uh, we don't have Arab teams playing in CAF uh, <laughs> because CAF is a is, is a African uh, Confederation of African Football, so we don't have Arab uh, teams playing in uh, in CAF competitions. But um, what I just wanted to let know is you as a lawyer, when you're advising your client, you must go through the legal regime such that you appreciate the regulatory challenges, such that you do not promise and sell what you do not have control over. That is what the, the point I was trying to put across. So the, the cases may differ. There should be jurisdictions where it is fine, while others do not. So we need to handle it as a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, then on the other issue of 256, I think I don't have uh, so, ma so many facts, but for what I've read um, on, on, the, on the same, uh, it goes clearly to the element that we are talking about of ambush marketing. Because I know, like in Uganda, the awards themselves are used as, uh, as property by the clubs. So they sell out the awards to somebody who comes and invests money in the sports, in football, for example, which money is used for football. So if another party comes and enjoys the same rights and uh, organizes the same set of, uh, of awards for which the clubs are supposed to get money, and this entity gets money from other sponsors, uses 30% of the money for the awards, and walks out with 70% without putting it back into football, as a game, it may have challenges. But how do you cure and remedy that? By taking on registration and enforcement of the intellectual property rights that you want to protect. So briefly. Thank you, Alex. Leticia, Leticia you can speak. Leticia Shitagwa, as you can see, your, your hand has been raised. Hi, can I be heard? Yes, you can be heard. Oh, thank you. Uh, my question is to Senior Council Patricia. Um, uh, there's a trend normally we see sports persons uh, normally cry that, yes, they have talent, maybe they've been involved in boxing, athletics, football. And then you see, you, you meant to understand if you're promoting your talent, money is coming, like you're generating income. So my question is, what really is the problem? Is it that when players get involved in maybe generating income by, by their talent, is it that the contracts, they don't understand the contracts which have been drafted, that's why money is lost in between, or the, uh, the measures that have been put in place in how income is generated for players is unfair that most of them are actually called in that system. Uh, so, uh, in summary, what I'm just, I just wanted to know is where exactly is the problem that players normally uh, keep uh, complaining that uh, when, let's say, if they retire or maybe they get injured, they appear to be broke, but yet we see that they are playing and they're making money. So, what exactly is the problem and how in our Kenyan system is that addressed? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question, although I think my commercial colleagues are better placed. But uh, in the end of the day, uh, your talent is a product which you have to use. Unfortunately, you have a short window within which to use it. Um, that's why it is important to have a good support team to enter the correct contracts, which will make sure that you benefit. For instance, like what Prof has discussed about image rights. If you are unable to secure your image rights, especially in a place like Kenya, where there is technically no legal framework, uh, it becomes difficult for you because after you stop playing, then that's it. So I think the challenge in, in Kenya is that first of all, we need to make our industry attractive so that we have huge sponsorships and also the quality of players needs to go up and players also need to be a little bit smart in their negotiation skills in how to negotiate a contract that will even continue giving you money even after you're done with the, with the season or you're done with that particular career. But I invite the other panelists to also uh, chip in on that. 
Yeah, hello. Um, maybe I just wanted to say something little on, uh, uh, in respect to what uh, Council Katisha has uh, highlighted. The concept of image rights is going to keep generating debate. And, and just like uh, Professor has hinted, because first of all, in certain jurisdictions, like what we have in East Africa, I believe it's the same story. Uh, there is no one-stop center legal regime for purposes of determining what exactly the image rights question is. For example, in Uganda, you have the constitution which provides for fundamental human rights. Then you have elements of uh, privacy law on privacy acts. Then you have elements of, uh, of uh, data protection. Now, from all these sets of laws, we keep picking components that would amount to clear protection of image rights. Unlike the European uh, jurisdiction that has developed, but also even in its development, there is no standardized definition of what exactly image rights are. It's a bundle of rights. So you'll, you'll still continue hearing disputes day in, day out, because even the, the, the mechanism of managing them is very difficult. Like the image right question of national teams is different from, from clubs. Because remember how, how, um, how are players engaged with their national teams in respect to the element of, of the image rights. And I think we will even have Professor say something extra on that. Because you have a player at times contracted by a club. He has sold his image rights to the club alongside his contract. And then this player is now called by the national team. When the image rights are being owned by the football club, how do you balance at the two? So uh, Professor will still say something on this, but the question of image rights does not have a one size fit all. It is, it is one that must be determined on the set of facts and what agreements have been signed by this particular authority in respect to the image rights. Thank you. You're right, Alex, and it's fine with us lawyers because we have a lot of cases pending. You know, uh, there's nothing is clear, nothing is, is, is true, but uh, at least we, we have managed to that are more or wide accepted. One, when you're training and when you're playing, this is part of your salary, part of your, um, let's say, you, you're giving to the club. The club has already paid you the salary, and when you play, you train, you are the club. Then the second one, the second step, as I said, when you're a football player, not with the shirts and not playing or, or training, and the other one, when you're VIP. This is more or less what is structure. But of course, as you said, it's a bundle, a lot. This is the first thing. The second thing I would like to say is that uh, there's a question about that. And I, I already answered, but I think that maybe I was not uh, so clear. There's a case right now in Uruguay with Cavani, Suarez, and all the big names against the national team because they want a part, a portion of what the national team is, is given by the sponsors. So one clear issue is in all the world is that when you're less than three players, you can't use the image of a player with the national team. It must be a three players. This is not written, as you said, but this is more or less accepted as a a custom mm -hmm. but even though even though that is something accepted players like Cavani, Suarez and all the national team players of Uruguay are now trying to go against the, no they are in a, in a case right now in uh, but to go other than that why national players are mandatorily going to the national teams why they can't just say I don't want to go because I want to protect my image rights. So if you want me, you have to pay me more. That's the key point, the crucial point. And then it comes to something different, to politics. Mm -hmm. If you don't go to your national team, you are sanctioned and you can't be registered. You can't play in football, basketball, any sport, individual mm -hmm. team sport. 
So in other countries, it's more or less the same. I, I haven't seen a country which say that you are free to do whatever you want at all. So this is the starting point. And once you have the starting point, you have the second point is three players minimum when you're in a team, uh, team sport. And then what about the sharing? Are you giving me, in Spain, we have agreed that sponsors are paying the National Federation, National Federation is giving the, the, the players a share of that. But in other countries, in most of the countries, I might say, in 99% of the countries, they are not doing that. In Argentina, uh, until five years ago, Messi or no one was getting any amount of money for the image rights. Now they are getting, that's why, that's why Uruguay and so on are trying to do, the, to, the, to do that too. So not a clear and let's say evident issue on image rights and is there, is there, but the key point on the national and international uh, or the clubs and national teams is there. Are they obliged? It is like a military service. Yes. <laughs> you have a ball instead of a weapon, but you are going to, to play or you have a racket and you play uh, game with the Ugandan team or, or Kenyan team or Spanish team, then you can say no, because tennis is indeed a sport. When it comes to team sport, you can't say no to your national team. In Spain, somebody can say no, Nadal can say no, I don't go to Tokyo, even though it was draft, because I'm too, I mean, I'm too old to go and, and, and play back and forth. But if it's football, basketball, handball, rugby, say you must go, to the national team or you will get a sanction and on the image rights now we can see the nft non fungible token which is a no a, a new novelty a absolute novelty and as i said an artist together with a sportman uh, zanetti they have sold for eleven thousand um, dollars one nft and i've been told that um a dunk a special dunk done by LeBron James was sold on $215,000 with his name and of course his signature and him talking. This is my best dunk, something like that, you know? Uh, image rights, yes. Is the end? No. Is the beginning, of course, yes. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Luganda. Now well, probably we will get, we will hear from Roger Luswata to ask his question before we move to the next. Kindly unmute Roger. He left. Uh, then we can have a Shaba Agri. We are alone, they all left. Ashaba. Thank you, I think I, uh, I raised my hand in um, my mistake, but I'll still make a contribution. First of all, I'd like <laughs> to thank the presenters. Uh, I saw my friend Alex uh, present a very powerful, uh, uh, very powerfully on the sponsorships uh, and also Lukambi. Uh, presenting very strongly on the law, the deficiency of the law. And I'd like to say, first of all, the name is Ashaba Agre. I'm the vice chairman of KCCA Football Club. And I interact a lot with the, those two distinguished gentlemen, especially on uh, things to do with uh, law and the law of sport, stroke the business of sport. Um, I'd like to thank also our presenter from Spain um, for that powerful uh, delivery. But I'd like to say that I think for us to be from the club side, for us to be able to build a functional and sustainable business industry, especially for Uganda, we will need to get as many uh, legal practitioners interested in the sport, understanding it better, so that they can tailor solutions for the industry that can take it forward. The challenge we currently have is that even the sports law deficiencies that um, uh, Lukambi has just highlighted, we do not have enough brains or people 
who are willing to sit down to structure these things so that they can be able to support the game. Secondly, one of the other challenges that we have from this club side are things to do with solidarity, uh, fees, for example, things to do with training compensations, things to do with the international transactions, where we have challenges in case there are defaults and we have to seek for redress. It has, I'm very glad to hear that at least now, uh, Cairo has been designated as one of the CAS uh, tribunal officers because it's easier for us at least to get there and be able to seek redress. Because I will tell you that probably in every single country across Africa, they are owed numerous amounts of money through compensation and training and solidarity claims that has never come. Because clubs, after they have done the transaction, they completely disappear. And enforcing an agreement becomes a bit of a challenge. Two is that uh, contracting players also is a bit of um, something that if you want to go with European trends, we also find challenges in getting them approved by federations. So probably, for example, you want to do a contract which is a three plus one plus one with different uh, incentives and benefits for the player. But the Federation is insisting that the contract has to be a solid three years, or you want to contract a minor and you have to find creative ways of trying to do it as a business entity. But the Federation or the regulators are telling you this is how it's supposed to be, and this is how it's supposed to be. Largely, I may not fault them, but I also think that the laws that come from FIFA, some of them have not evolved to allow businesses to be creative. Yet in Europe, I have seen contracts of different players that are slightly very different from what FIFA um, stipulates, but they have given the clubs the benefit of or the leeway to structure a contract as if it's a commercial transaction agreement. Because the player is an asset to the club. He's not just an employee, like the normal corporate environment. He's an asset to the club, so the club has to make sure that they can be able to extract, extract the maximum value from him, both as an, a player at their time or when he has to leave as a, during the transfer period. And these are some of the things that we are struggling with. Obviously, the other things are around sports medicine and how much we can go into and the use of technologies. Okay. Uh, what type of technologies are admissible in the sport? What are not admissible? And how far can, can clubs go in trying to influence decision making for their own success? I think for me, that would be my contribution for now because uh, we could speak for a whole day, but thank you very much for giving me an opportunity. Mokwa, I have to leave. So I, I, if I may just ask uh, uh, Mr. Ashaba and uh, then uh, I will be sorry, but uh, Mr. Ashaba is, is, is absolutely right when he said that uh, you need more sports lawyer. That's why I was in Kenya three years ago. That's why I'm trying to be the, the master in, in Ghana for African lawyers. You need that. But let me say something too. Sometimes the clubs are guilty because they have the possibility to go to a sports lawyer and they choose not to go. They have to avoid paying fees. And at the end of the day, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. It's worse. they have to face a FIFA claim that they failed to be on time, that they, they lost the deadline or they fail to, to have a, a proper answer or proper claim sometimes. So, Ashaba, yes, I'm with you, but look around you. There are some sports lawyers already. And of course, we need more. But me, 30 years ago, I was treated like a, a foolish guy. Sports law, what for? There were no sports lawyer in Real Madrid, in Barcelona, in Manchester United. No one was there in-house. And I said, you, look, you, do, you need an in-house and you need an, also somebody who's working outside. And now you have five, six, 10, 11 in a big club. In small club, you have one or two lawyers, in Europe, I mean. And this is why, because we lawyers, we make that happen. So yeah. In Africa, we are not because we are better, because we started first. And 30 years ago, I did that. Now it's your turn to do that. And I, I see Alex, I see Dennis, I see Mokwa, I see Janet, willing to do that, already doing that. And uh, that's all. 
I'm, I will be here always that anytime you need me, not to, to be a professor, but just to, to give my experience. So I will be here. And then I will try to, to do my best to prepare, to prepare for next year this, this master in Ghana, because I think that is something that is needed, absolutely needed in Africa. The first step was to have Cairo in CAS, you know, but we were struggling for that in Cairo, in Kuala Lumpur, in Abu Dhabi, in Buenos Aires, in Mexico, in all the other places that not Switzerland, New York, and Sydney. We struggle, we struggle for, to have the Spanish as an official language because we are 15% of the cases in CAS and 20% of the cases in CAS. And now it's your turn to struggle also with that. And Ashaba is fine, is, is, is right, but he needs to go and to see around that sometimes clubs are not aware of what they need or if they are aware they choose not to be aware because it's too costly for them i don't think so at the end of the day but it was and last but not least i've just sent uh, through the, the chat my instagram my firm instagram because besides the fact that you are already in this instagram you have been there uh, as the lecture of today i think that uh, it will be also fine for you to understand that sometimes I give some input, some milestones, some uh, other classes from other countries in English that also Spanish too, but English, uh, for instance, I, I did that for China and you have, you, if you go to Instagram, you have the Chinese, in English, you have the Chinese answers of a lot of questions. So, I'm, you know, when I was young, I was willing to have what you have now. We didn't have anything. We were lost. So we have to be adventurous. We have to go and dig and dig more and more to, to try to get our, our path. Now, you have the chance, you have the possibilities, and I'm sure that you will do that. And uh, Janet, Brenda, Dennis, Alex, uh, everybody, thanks a lot to acknowledge me to be here. I will always be free for you. And But now it's time to prepare my hearing in an hour. Um, Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Prof. Okay, thank okay. you, Prof. Even as you remember yeah. Ghana, you can also remember <laughs> Kenya and stuff. <laughs> Maybe, uh, Mokua, I just wanted to add something little on um, in respect to Ashaba's uh, contributions. And I think Professor has uh, hinted on a number of them. Uh, to be specific for the FIFA players contract, FIFA provides a template, a template for the football player contract. But then it, it allows certain flexibilities. There are only core, core elements that are provided for in the same, but it does not mean that it is a do or die, that uh, it's either that or not, provided the body and core structure of the FIFA concerns are captured. Because if you look at the standard template of the contract, certain things are not applicable, even in, uh, in, 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 in Uganda, for example, as, as a country. So it's, it's important to know what the flexibility is. But I would also to hint on something, which is limitation. Most of the remedies under the bodies of FIFA and CAF, that is in respect to CAS, in respect to the dispute resolution chambers, of FIFA, the player status committees are time bound. Just like as lawyers in our normal litigation, we have the Limitation Act. So even FIFA, you must know what your cause of action is and whether it is in type. If you're demanding for, for unpaid monies or any other thing. So as lawyers, you need to be very careful about the limitation. Then uh, Agri raised something very important. That is the solidarity and uh, training compensation, which is supposed to be paid to the clubs through which a given player uh, passed on, on to transfer to the subsequent clubs. And as FUFA, and I believe just like all the other federations, FUFA has been insisting on a standardized and um, IT-generated registration system, such that you have players registered in the system of FUFA for you to be in the in, importance of that is that 15 years ahead, should a player that came from your club 
be transferred to Manchester United, then by law, you're entitled to a percentage of the transfer fees paid, either as training or solidarity comp compensation, among others. So we need, as clubs, to be very, very professional and uh, support the federation in some of those other efforts undertaken. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Brenda has a comment and a question. Thank you, Mokua. Um, my question is on, I think this is uh, Janet, is directed to Janet. Why is the government not allowed to address or even get involved in football federations? Uh, even when there are matters of corruption, yet the same federations will need the government agencies such as the ESCC. Okay, I can answer? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, okay, fine. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, sports is global, so we would like to have a universal system. However, when it comes to criminal matters, national laws prevail. There is no shelter or protection from any criminal matters. So when we say that uh, we, want, we don't want the government to be involved, it is being involved to where there's already a structure. And as long as we're within the rules and agreed upon standards, there is no business for the government to step in because it complicates issues and we are using different value systems to measure because there are different standards and different laws. So it's a misconception to say that the government is not involved in sports. When there are ills, especially things, as you mentioned, of corruption and doping, the national criminal structure does apply. But what we are trying to say is where there is something in place, there is no need to rubbish what is there and bring something, because it might be different from what uh, other countries are doing, and that brings the inconsistency and makes our country not attractive to players and uh, sponsors. Thank you, Janet. Uh, so we can move on to the next question in the Q&A section. Uh, hello, Mr. Dennis. Coming from the aspect of the National Federation, having the rights to an organized national team event, what is the current position in regards to image rights of certain international players like Dennis Onyango and the Federation FUFA? Is there a contract signed between the Federation and these players? Take, for example, the legal problem that arose when the Egyptian Football Federation used Mohamed Salah's image without his authorization. This is by Dio. It's a question by Dio. OK. Dio, thank you so much for that wonderful question. Uh, as my previous uh, colleagues mentioned and professor about image rights, it, is, uh, it generated a lot of debate. However, to be specific on what we do, we treat image rights uh, in fact, as a property, generally owned by the player. We respect the player's image rights, as we mentioned, depending on the available uh, scheme, national regime that we have based on the constitution, that the rights of the image, as we call it, of the player, generally it belongs to the player. Now, how do we deal with them? First of all, we allow them that every player, whether you're putting on a national team jersey, that right when you are alone or you are two in, in, in a picture or in a photograph, that rights belong to players entirely. So if any company except the competitor, for example, right now we have Airtel, telecom company being our official sponsor, you may not uh, sell your image rights or you may not contract with that uh, competitor, but any other, so long as you are an individual, whether you're putting on a jersey or not, and then if you are two or three or four, you can. So what we always regulate, we agree with them in a document, what we call, sometimes we call it a charter or a, a, what we call a, a conduct, the scheme of conduct that this one shall move. If there are four prayers in one picture, we agree with them that, right, and then donning Uganda Queen's jersey, for example, we agree with them that these rights shall belong to the federation and whatever comes out of sponsorship then it's always given to them in terms of bonuses so we always trade with them but we highly respect their rights as individuals 
But if they are not donning Crane's jersey, the national team jersey with a FIFA trademark, those rights, we don't have any say with them. So it's a thin line how we treat with them to avoid litigation. Thank you so much, Dennis. Uh, there's another question. Uh, is there any liability to a player or a team when they discredit the sponsor's products? For example, what Ronaldo did to Coca-Cola in the Euros 2020? That was a, to, the question is directed to De Dennis. It's from Honest Shio. Yeah, that's a very unique element that we've been, uh, but uh, generally what we do with that kind of arrangement, we always address our prayers in case uh, of uh, on sponsors that we have. For example, how they should behave towards the product of Airtel, who is our official sponsor and other partners. We always address them how they should behave as far as treating those properties. But the Federation sometimes takes responsibility. The example given it has not yet happened to, it's quite fortunate to have not received such instances of Cristiano removing Coca-Cola and uh, pressing it with water. It has not yet affected us, but we always take responsibility. And now the player, we may not make players liable because they are not employees, but whoever goes against the code of conduct, because that will be, we term it in a way of misconduct, but as far as concerned, the designation will be liable for that. But now the players will be dealt with the disciplinary. And normally, our disciplinary for international, for national team players is always maybe suspending them from the camp for or a specific game. We don't have any other mechanism of dealing with them. So if they have that action becomes an indiscipline by mistreating or by uh, dealing against the, the, the property of the sponsor, then basically we deal with them. This becomes a disciplinary matter. But in the case of any liability, then the regulation will be like. But with the Cristiano element, we have learned something new which we need to deal with it. We've been watching how UEFA dealt with it, but still it's not clear as we expect. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, the next question uh, from Anonymous attendee. <laughs> if a player gets injured while playing, the most, uh, the most cases I've seen is they undergo treatment, and I'm sure the sponsors cater for this treatment. My question is, what is the regulation on injuries while playing? So I am not sure who this is directed to, but it's open-ended. Any of the panelists can answer this. Yeah, for players, uh, for example, football players, we have a very good experience. And the, as I mentioned earlier, almost 60% of the jurisprudence we use in terms of managing players, it is from FIFA, as far as football is concerned. That's the industry I've been working in so much and then having some ideas in basketball. But the bottom line is if a player gets an injury while playing for a club, the club has to take that uh, liability fully. Even when the player is playing for the national team, unfortunately, the rules are if a player is called for the national team of Kenya from Goma here and then player gets injured, the federation by cutters can assist. But the, by virtue of the contract, the employment contract between a player and a club, the club takes full responsibility for that injury. And at no time should that club terminate that contract. If they want to terminate, then they will have to compensate the player for the less, for the all the time of the contract that was not served. So the club takes full responsibility. And this is in football. I'm not so much aware of other areas. But the federations like FUFA, what we do always over an insurance of the players at national teams. And then we also assist the clubs out of cutters. But the general rule, the player can't be in the middle. If the federation can't do it, the club has to do it. That's football. I need to hear from other athletes like individual games, maybe cricket, athletics. I am not so sure how they deal with it. OK, thank you so much. Uh, I think this question is directed to Janet. Uh, how is the question of high testosterone in women versus transgender athletes being handled or harmonized in sports disputes? Uh, thank you for that uh, question. I think uh, right now we are bound by the decisions which have already been made by CAS because uh, according to the rules, there is a limit of the testosterone. Uh, of course, it it's also brings an element of discrimination because if you're born like that naturally and you are female, why all of a sudden, just because you have a hormonal imbalance, you're being called, you're not being allowed, like the case of Casta Semenye. 
Um, she has appealed her decision, so we're waiting for the outcome of that case. But this is really uh, something which is which is becoming quite relevant. Many of our athletes are affected, especially the African descent. And uh, I don't know, maybe it's time for some reform. But unfortunately, as the rules are right now, that's the way it, it is applied. Yeah, maybe I, I, I also just had something little to add in respect to that. Uh, we are eagerly waiting for us who are in the field of sports law practice, waiting for the appeal, Casta Semenya's appeal, to see uh, what exactly the, the, the court will say. But uh, on the other part, uh, it's very difficult to legislate against nature. And, 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 and that's where, for me, I, I'm eagerly waiting to see what exactly will happen. Because what is happening in the, in, in the Semenya case, the decision that is subject to the appeal, is that you are legislating against nature. Now, for example, Africans, we have an extra melanin pigment, which certain parts of the world may not have by virtue of where we are geographically situated and by our circumstances, our bodies may be able to tolerate certain endurances which may not be there in certain parts of the world. So should authorities pay for being who they are and for being their natural selves? And, and, and for me, um, it, it, it's, a very, it's a very tricky, tricky, decision but as sports lawyers we are bound by the decision right now that it, that is in offing but it's an area that uh, needs very serious reform maybe if i may just highlight the flip side so there's an understanding of why this issue is coming around but on the flip side the iwf was uh, saying that the importance of this rule is to make sure that it's fair play because if you have an advantage, then it's no longer fair, especially when it comes to athletics, which requires uh, physical and bodily strength. So that's the what needs to be balanced. Are we going to balance the integrity of the sport instead of fair play and public interest? Are we going to discriminate somebody for a natural occurrence? So it's very tricky. And it, yeah. we're waiting for the discussion. <laughs> in, in, in fact, I, 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 the same thing was happening. If it's swimming, and one of the swimmers is seven feet tall with very long legs and arms. And then the other is 4.5 feet tall. Will you now say that the other should not participate in the swimming because he's too tall for, for, for the game? So should those be the considerations? Because we wanted to put it, for example, outside football or outside athletics and you put it in all the other sports and see. But it's one funny element that we are still waiting. It's a debate a raging debate within the practice area. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, members of the panel, and th th thank you for, to the, all the attendees who made this day uh, possible. Thank you, Janet, for creating time. Uh, we, we had to reschedule so many times, so many phone calls, and you are uh, amenable to the flexibilities. Thank you, Alex. Uh, we, yeah. I have disturbed you a lot through WhatsApp, <laughs> same as Dennis. Uh, the same as Brenda, and thank you, the East African Law Society, for making this possible. We really appreciate, and this is the first of many in which we are going to organize in the area of sports law. And we believe we have impacted on the lives of so many young lawyers. We believe that even the players who logged in today have learned a thing or two. And uh, and in future, we we hope that we have more of this. We will uh, maybe we will form a network of East African Young Lawyers Association, whereby we can share ideas, share tips on how we can improve the quality of practice in sports law in the region, and also influence uh, policies and laws that affect our area of practice and that we believe are unfair at the moment. Thank you all, and I sincerely appreciate your presence here today. Now, shukuru sana. Thank you, Mokwa. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, we will be sharing the emails of our panelists so that you can interact with them further. 
and ask all the questions. We, uh, we are so sorry. We have actually surpassed our 4 p.m. timeline by 30 minutes. So we'll have to end the webinar. But thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, you are welcome again to become a member of the East Africa Law Society. And yeah, see you next month for our monthly webinar. Thank you so much. You're free to leave. Our webinar has come to an end. <laughs>